Okay, in this video I'm going to talk about another type of basket. You may have seen my stenciled sandwiched basket that I did earlier. In this case I'm going to do a basket where the sides are actually made of contoured cookie dough. I won't show you how to contour the cookie dough in this video, you're going to have to wait to the next one, but I'm going to show you how to put it all together um, from contoured pieces through to filling it with flour, flowers and leaves all made of cookies. So the finished product is going to look something like what you see here. And the elements that you need for it are a base that's top coated with the top coat ideally completely dry. I've got a whole other video about top coating and how to get this smooth glassy coat. So just suffice it to say for now, it's, it takes some practice, but that video can walk you through the steps. I've done this, I've dried it overnight because we will be stacking something on it so we want the icing dry. And just as a frame of reference, this cookie is, it looks four and a half inches wide. I used a fluted round cutter, a pretty standard shape that's available online in most cake and cookie decorating supply houses as well. So you'll need a base. This one's just been top coated. I'm going to show you how I detailed it. In this, this is a finished base that has some dots around it and I'm going to show you how to do a bit of a dot work, but for now we'll put that aside. And the other two elements you need to form the primary part of the basket are two pieces of contoured cookie dough. I bake these around a tin can essentially and we're going to show that as I said in another video. So we've got these these three pieces. I've used gingerbread here. Um, my gingerbread recipe, which is posted on my site, is particularly great for contouring cookie doughs because it does not spread too much. So when it's wrapped around a really weird convoluted shape in the oven, it's not going to break and tear on you. But every dough is different, so just, you know, it might have to do a little bit of trial and error if you're working with not my recipe because each behaves a little bit differently. If the recipe's got more butter in it or more leavening, it may spread more in the oven and not hold up so well around sh contoured shapes. Um, as an example, here's, I baked this a while ago. This is tinted sugar cookie dough. I tinted it pink. It did pretty well. This is my standard sugar cookie dough recipe that I have um, on my site and in my books as well. But there's a little bit of splitting and cracking here because this tends to have more, this, this dough has more butter in it. And again, a little bit more leavening. It, it behaves a little bit uh, a little bit differently, especially around really sharp corners um, like so. It's going to spread and crack perhaps a bit more. So when in doubt, use gingerbread and use my gingerbread recipe. It's my standard um, cutout cookie gingerbread and it's rather delicate tasting yet still sturdy enough to do 3D constructions. Okay, so that's a little bit on the doughs to use. I've put aside the sugar cookie ones because we're going to work with the gingerbread here completely. And we'll come back to detailing the base. I want to show you how to put these sides together. Pretty straightforward. When they come baked out of the oven, it's never, I, I bake a half, a slightly over a half of the basket, and then I piece them together. And they never come completely together in a round shape. I like to have a little bit of spare on each piece and then trim it down to size to make a perfect fit. It's just easier that way. So you'll notice this is not a round circle, but we're going to try to make it round. Um, what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll, I'll stack them on top of each other and look at them and say, okay, gee, I'll get a rough visual gauge of how much I need to trim off each end so that when they are pieced together, it's roughly circular. And <clears throat> I trim primarily off of one side of the basket rather than the other so that the front facing piece is longer than the back side. So you never really see that seam if you're looking at the basket front on. So I'm going to trim it looks like I need to trim a good half an inch off at least one of the pieces so I get it a rounder shape. And I'm going to do that off the back. This is going to be the back piece. I'm going to trim it off the back piece and we'll see how it stacks up. This dough is um, soft enough to actually cut off fairly large chunks with. If you find your dough is really, really hard, you might want to jump to a microplaning tool and shave it off more gradually because you'll run less risk of actually breaking off a big chunk of cookie. But because my dough is pretty soft, I'm going to see if I can't start by taking off a big piece simply by cutting with a very sharp paring knife about, oops, I broke a little bit of the bottom of the basket off. See, there's the risk of that. But I might not have to carve as much off the other side. Um, so let me just see where I am again. I think that they're in better alignment, but I do want to take a little bit more off the side. So good news is that hopefully I can cover up that, that broken piece right there. I'm going to trim a little more gradually just so I don't break any more off. And, and, maybe, and shaving, if, it's a, if the dough is hard, is, is sometimes a safer idea than just simply doing one big 
cut down the side. This makes a bit of a mess, so you want to do this when you're not icing other things so you don't get crumb in your icing. It's still not a great fit, so I am going to trim a little bit off actually the other side so it comes together a little bit more round. And this, right now I'm just doing broad brush cuts and trims, and we'll come, you know, I'll perfect the seam by taking my microplaner, which is nothing more than a grading tool, and making sure that those seams are really tightly fitting. So I usually come back at the edges a couple of times before I get it cut to the point that I like the fit. And I still feel it fits better this way. I still feel like I can take a little bit off this back side. Maybe not as much now. I'm trimming much less liberally now. I think I took about an eighth of an inch off there. And I'll take another eighth of an inch off the side that I cracked at an angle before because I want to clean up that part anyway. And now I've got something that's much closer to a round shape, pretty nicely fitting, I think, at least fitting well enough for the purposes of this, this, this construction. However, it's a pretty jagged, rough fit here, so I am going to take a smaller tool now and just my microplaner and just, just shave this until it's flat and nicely, really nicely, perfectly fitting. The, the cleaner the seams you get, they're gonna be covered with this wafer paper that's gonna go around them. A wa actually, it's a frosting sheet, an edible paper. So the seams won't end up being visible, but the more tightly they fit together, the less lumpy that seam will appear when I, when I wrap the paper around it. So now I've got it fairly straight, except for this little hitch there. So I'm gonna put that on the bottom of the basket. I'm gonna do the same on the other side. Just get it nice, straight, up and down, flat. And as I said, if your dough is really hard, you might have a hard time getting a paring knife through it, so you might want to just shave from the get-go, though you'll be shaving for a pretty long time if you have to take off as much cookie dough as I did. So there you have it. Beautiful, nice fit. Looking at it from top down, it looks like a circle, or as close as it can get, and that seems all been evened out. The next step is to glue the ring together. You want to glue those two pieces together with icing, with royal icing, a thick royal icing, before you wrap it with the colorful edible papers, because you don't want it moving around on you as you try to wrap it. So this would be a kind of thing you'd want to do about half an hour, 45 minutes before you wrap it with a paper. I've got thick royal icing, what I call my glue consistency, which is roughly a formulation of about two pounds of powdered sugar to five large egg whites, or the equivalent thereof in pasteurized egg whites. And I'm just putting as little as I need to on the edge of the seam. I like to work on cardboard for this, little card, cut out cardboard pieces, because then once I'm done working on this one, I can move it away and just bring in another one. They're very mobile this way, because they do need to be moved out of your work area while they dry. Okay, so I've glued it together. I've just put a little bit in the seam. And I can, I can pick it up now. It's only been a couple of minutes and I can still pick it up because my icing was really thick. But one thing I do want to do is make sure that any icing that's smushed to the outside of the seam gets scraped off because that'll dry hard and it'll leave a little ripple or a ridge when I come to wrap the frosting sheet around the cookie. The other thing I like to do is reinforce the inside with more icing. This won't be seen, so I'm more liberal with the application of icing to the inside. I'm holding this up normally, just so the camera can hopefully see it. Normally I would do this with it sitting down. Um, it, my fingers are clean if you'd like, you know, if you'd like to use a spatula, that's fine too, but oftentimes I just smear that to the inside. It gives it a little more reinforcement, and I will do that on the other side as well. Then one last look to make sure that it's nice and round from the top and that there's nothing peeking out of these seams and it looks pretty good. It's okay if it's messy on the inside because that'll all be filled in the end. I'm gonna set that aside to dry. Again, I let this sit probably an hour until that icing is completely dry and before I start wrapping the edible paper around it. I'm gonna clear off this work surface. I'm gonna then come back and detail the base so you can see how I did the dot work and then we'll wrap the contoured cookie basket. 
Okay, I cleaned up my area. I don't like to have any crumbs around when I'm icing because it just, they invariably like get in the icing and that's just ugly. So off this particular basis, I'm gonna do a row of dots around the perimeter. I've got three rows of dots here and I'll tell you how to do that. I'm not gonna do it today, but I'll tell you how to, how to handle that if you want that kind of intricate border. I don't do much as far as border on these cookies. For instance, I'm not stenciling the base as I did on my other sandwich baskets because that, that basket's gonna cover the vast majority of it. So I'm just doing a little bit of edge work. I've got icing of beadwork consistency in my parchment cone, which means for every cup of that glue, that very, very thick royal icing that I use, I usually add about two to three teaspoons of water to kind of loosen it up. And I've got blue to contrast my pink base. Holding my pastry cone at about a 90 degree angle to the surface, I simply push out a dot. I want these pretty big. My opening here is less than an eighth of an inch. I don't have to open it much. I'm controlling how big the dot is simply by how, how hard I'm pushing and how loose the icing is. The looser the icing is, the less I have to push it. It just flows out. But I am pushing to a certain extent. And the cool thing about these scalloped cutters, this fluted cutter that I used as a base, it's a, it's a super great piping guide for me because I just put a dot in each little scallop and I don't have to worry about how they're spaced so much. Okay, just four more dots to fill in these remaining little scallops. And, and there it is complete. Now if I wanted to come in and put another row of white dots above the blue dots, I would let these dots dry just in, until a skin had formed on them, really literally a few minutes, but it depends on the ambient conditions. The drier it is outside, the faster they'll dry. And then I'd Simply, I'll, give you, I'll show you an example. We'll put this on the back side of the basket. I'd come in between two dots and pipe another dot. And again, I like to do that when there's some, these have been allowed to dry because if I come too close, they do tend to bleed together, but if it's dry, there's less likelihood of that happening. And then I just continue in that vein to finish out the base of the basket. I'm gonna put that aside. I'm gonna move over some frosting sheets. We'll talk a little bit about what they are. And then we'll apply them, as I said, to that contoured piece that we just put together. And then we'll move into the final assembly of the baskets. Okay, I'm back. My cookie ring that I put together before, the base of the basket, is now dry. Certainly dry enough for me to pick it up in one piece and wrap it with these edible papers. Um, before I actually wrap it with edible paper, I want to tell you what range of edible papers are out there. I have a whole video that it will explore this or does explore it in great detail, but I'm gonna to touch on it here and then tell you the type that I prefer to use for this particular type of basket. Basically, edible papers is the generic term and there are different types of papers that fall underneath them. Wafer paper is one and frosting sheets is another. And the primary difference is that wafer paper is made with potato starch and water and then dehydrated into thin sheets. Whereas edible papers are, the primary starch in them is either tapioca starch or corn starch. So they're a little uh, weightier and thicker and gummier. Um, edible papers, um, frosting sheets that is, also have sugar in them, whereas wafer paper does not. So there's some differences. Um, I prefer for this particular project, I'm preferring to use frosting sheets because as I said, the corn starch or tapioca starch in them and some of the other additives to the edible papers or the frosting sheets make them a little less see-through um, and they also give them more body so they can stick to a naked cookie without that cookie being iced. Wafer paper will not stick to a naked cookie. So I'm working with frosting sheets to be clear. But frosting sheets uh, do vary <laughs> in their weights. Um, this is a frosting sheet. They come pre-printed in different patterns or they come plain. So I've got two different types here. Um, but they are not all created equal. This particular pre-printed one is made with tapioca starch. It is somewhat sheer. So if I were to put it up against this gingerbread, you'd see some gingerbread showing through behind it, which is not ideal for what I want to do. So I'm actually going to double up this tapioca starch based frosting sheet with a much heavier weighted, not much heavier weighted because each of these things is you know, very, 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 very thin. But this is a frosting sheet made with cornstarch and it's got more weight to it. You can't actually see through it. So I'm gonna double these up before putting them on so that we don't see through my pretty patterned frosting sheet. One other word about frosting sheets, as I said, they do come in pretty pre-printed patterns, but if you don't 
like the particular patterns you're seeing, you can also design your own frosting sheets. This is just an example of, uh, this had been a plain strip, a frosting sheet, but I rubber stamped on it, these little chicks, and then I painted on it with food coloring to create the sky and the grass. So it's possible to customize the strips that you put around these baskets as well. I thought that might be pretty cute for Easter um, to wrap that around that particular basket. But we're not going to use that. I'm going to use the flowers and show you how I do them back to back. Um, in this case, since I'm working, the rubber stamp version was done on one of the weightier frosting sheets. I wouldn't have to double it up. I would just stick it directly onto the cookie. But I'm going to use the daisy one and I am going to back it with that heavier paper. Uh, oh, one last word before I show you how to do that. The frosting sheets typically come in 8 by 10, 8 by 11 in sheets. And they come on a backing paper, you know, so you peel them off before you put them on the cookie. You don't want to eat this inedible part. Um, but before I take it off the backing, I always cut it to the size I need to fit the basket. It's easier to cut it with the backing paper on it. Uh, so this particular strip that you saw here, to get it really nice and straight, I cut it on a paper cutter. I measured the height of my basket, and it's about one and three quarters inches tall. I cut this actually about one and a half, so I'll show so in this particular basket, there'll be a nice area for me to apply a little beaded border and a little bit of the gingerbread will show. You could, you could cut it exactly the height of the basket, but sometimes I like to leave a little edge at the top. So that's a little bit about the different type of papers and how you would handle them to cut them into strips. I'm going to move these extra pieces aside and then show you how I would apply them. As I said, wafer paper, which is the type of edible paper that's made with rice paper, will not stick to a naked cookie, but this stuff will. And this will stick with just a thin smear of light corn syrup, which is what I've got in this container here. To do this, though, um, I like to work on parchment paper because the corn syrup kind of gets everywhere. And that way, I don't have to clean my work surface up as often if I do line it with parchment paper. And I am going to take the, the backing strip, this heavier one, off its backing sheet. And I'm going to give it a light coating of corn syrup. For this, I, tend, I use a sponge brush. Um, this has red food coloring on it, but the red food coloring is pretty washed out. If you use, um, so it's not going to, I'm hopefully, knock on wood, smear red food coloring on my white here. So you want to make sure your sponge brush is as clean as possible. This one's been used for other purposes and got stained, but it is, I'm hoping, very clean. And you'll notice I'm not, um, I'm not pooling the corn syrup on top. I never want to see like a big, big, pool of it there because this paper will dissolve if it gets too wet or become just really hard to handle. So I'm just making it, putting it on enough to make it tacky. It's kind of moving all over on me here. Um, tacky all over the top. And wafer paper, which we're not working with, is even more prone to dissolving with too much corn syrup on it. So, you know, I, I try not to be overly liberal with it but just you want to cover the whole area because we're going to stick that daisy piece on top of it so that we can't don't see through the daisy piece these strips i'm kind of confined i should say to how long i can cut the strip i cut the longest dimension off that sheet that i just showed you and i don't know that it's going to fit all the way around this particular basket it's a little big so i might have to patch the back side Okay, so I just peeled the daisy piece off its backing paper, and I'm now sticking it onto the white piece. And then I'm going to lift it up and show you that it's, it's, much, it's very difficult to see through it now. And so that's just going to show up much more nicely, the pattern, when I wrap it around that basket. Now, when I applied the corn syrup to the white strip, I got some on this piece of parchment paper. Um, what I next need to do is put corn syrup on the back of this white strip so that it'll stick to the cookie. But I don't want to lay, lay it directly on the area where I just worked because if I get corn syrup on the front of that, it will eventually dry. But it'll dry with a really shiny spot, and I don't want to see that. So I'm going to get a clean piece of parchment paper down here so there's no risk of actually getting corn syrup on the face of the daisies when I turn it over. My hands are a little sticky from the corn syrup, and you'll notice that I'm cleaning them off, and that's so that they don't stick to this paper and potentially tear the paper when I try to get my hands off of it. So I'll be cleaning my hands a lot through this process, too. 
Now you could apply the corn syrup directly to the cookie, but since my paper doesn't cover the entire side of the cookie, I don't want to do that because if I go too far up the side with it, again, the corn syrup will dry, but it'll leave a shiny spot and that's not what I want to see. So I'm going to apply it directly to the paper as I did before. It's a little harder to apply it directly to the paper simply because there's more risk of the paper kind of tearing or breaking because it is fragile but than if you were to apply it to a cookie. But in this case, I just I think I run more risk of getting corn syrup up the sides of that basket than I do breaking this paper. So we're going to do it this way. Okay, that is looking pretty good. I'm going to put that corn syrup aside. One other note about frosting, sh frosting sheets, they are pliable. But they, they need to be stored in plastic, resealable, reclosable bags because if they are left out at room temperature, particularly on a dry, cold day, they will become brittle and break very, very fast. Wafer paper, which is made with rice paper, doesn't behave the same way. It could be left out without getting brittle. It's brittle to begin with. But this, if I'm going to reuse this, I want to repackage it in my plastic bag pretty quickly just so that it doesn't get unusable. Okay, so I've got that, that coated on the back. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I've got a front of my basket, which is the, the side of the basket that has more arc to it. Um, so I always wrap the front of the basket first so that the seams are kind of towards the back of the basket, if that makes sense. And so I stick it, the middle part, to the middle part of the front and then just guide the rest of the frosting sheet around the back so it comes all the way around the back. It's nice to kind of have it still on the cardboard to do this because I use the base of the cardboard as a guide. You know, the tendency is to lift this up and then it kind of buckles. So if I, as long as I keep the bottom part of the paper flush with the cardboard, it should wrap pretty nicely. Now I am a little bit short on this basket. This is a particularly big basket. So if, if I want it, I won't do it today. I can come back in with a smaller piece of paper and just patch that so that it'll view nicely from all sides. But the seam areas are nicely covered and you've got a cute looking little basket. I am going to run my fingers along the top edge a little bit just to make sure it's in the bottom edge, just to make sure it's completely stuck down to the gingerbread. The advantage with frosting sheets is they do stick, as I said, to naked cookies, uniced cookies, and they also have enough weight that I can apply icing on top of it almost immediately. With wafer paper, if, I'm apply, if I were to apply icing on top of it to decorate on top of it, that wet icing would cause the wafer paper to buckle. But here, I, I can put a top border on this almost immediately. My paper was really wet here and I overhandled it and you'll see that I tore a bit of that paper off. So just be a little bit wary of that. You know, touch it as little as you have to and don't get it over wet. But I think that looks pretty good looking at it from the side. So the next step is to clear off the workspace and I'm going to stick this down onto another base. This is a base I had earlier. My other one that I just put the beads on is still drying. So I want to get this stuck into place. And I can do that with the same brown glue that I used before to put the two sides together. Just want to make sure that it's actually working. And I want to make sure it's centered again on the base. I'm going to rotate my front a little bit so I hide that rip part of the basket there from the front view. And then to glue this in place, I am piping icing along the bottom of the basket and gluing it effectively onto the blue. And I've got my trussing needle, which I can use to kind of push that icing more into the corners. If your fingers are clean, you can also smear it in and to anchor it in place. And I'll do that on both sides of the basket. And this won't need much drying time because this thing stands on its own, unlike those sandwich baskets. I can, I can start decorating it almost immediately. But if you wanted to let it dry so this doesn't shift around side to side, that's a certainly a fine thing to do too. So that's how you put on the paper and anchor it to the base of the basket. I'm going to move over my canister here and I'm going to put some decorative detail on the top edge here. I, feel, I forgot that I have a big open gingerbread area here and I want a, a, more beads along, beads of icing along the top. 
And as I said before, the good news about frosting sheets is you can pipe on them almost directly after they've been applied. So I'm going to take that blue, that I, and I'm, I'm elevating this um, so that I can see the dots in my line of sight. If this were sitting down on the countertop, I couldn't tell you if the dots were round or angled because I'm not looking at them head on. So if I had my druthers, I'd actually elevate this up to my eye level to work on it. When I'm, when I'm piping on the side of something, I, I always elevate the piece that I'm working on because otherwise I can't see what I'm doing. So if I slouch a little bit here to do that, do this, it's because I'm trying to get um, my eyes as square on to the side of this basket as possible. And I am going to put my eyeglasses on for this too. Now, uh, as I said, if I were doing this for a gift or for real or for uh, a real customer, I would definitely fill in that gap there. And I can, sh I can show you how you would do that. I think I have a little piece here. Simply just cut, just simply cut another strip of the same height down to size and stick it stick it in there if you wanted to get fussy about it you could match up the daisies but we're going to move forward and i'm going to show you how to put dots on the top again this is icing of beadwork consistency and if it's of the right consistency it will form a nice rounded shape on its own even when piped vertically on the side of something. I'm going to rotate that around so the camera can see. Those are nice round dots. And I'll just continue all the way around. It just kind of cleans up the edge and it's you're going to see that it's hopefully it'll hide that seam here a little bit. I'm going to try to get a dot kind of into that area. Because I do like to conceal that seam as much as possible. And as usual I am steadying particularly when I'm piping vertically, my bag will shake. So I need some steadying devices. I'm doing this a couple ways. I'm steadying this hand on the canister and using it to steady the tip. And I'm also resting this elbow against my counter. And it's the combination of all those things that is allowing me to pipe nice and neatly. If I were out here trying to do it, I'd be shaking a lot more. Now, I'm beginning not to see where I'm piping, so I'm going to rotate. I'm going to look at it from the side and make sure my dots are even and nicely shaped. If there's one I hate, you know, if it's particularly big or small or a strange shape, I'll let the dot dry, set up a little bit, and then I'll flick it off with my handy dandy trussing needle again and then just repipe it. So I always have this by my side as I'm doing any kind of piping work because it's good for cleaning off mistakes as well as steading stencils and doing a whole bunch of other things when you're decorating. We'll just complete the top here and then the next step will be taking a basket that's dried with all the dry details on it and assembling it into the finished products that I showed you at the start of the video. I've got some other little cookie doodads that I'll be putting inside like cookie flowers and leaves and some butterflies that I'll be sticking on the side. Those were all pre-iced and allowed to dry so that they're easy to assemble when I come to this part of the process. Trying to assemble anything with wet icing on it is just like a mistake. It's just going to get messy. So how are those dots looking? Pretty good. I think they would look rounder if I were, um, you know, th if this were closer to my line of sight. If I were to elevate this maybe another few inches. So I do recommend doing that if you're piping vertically. Okay, so I've come around to the back. Of course, I would finish it off all the way around. And there you have kind of finished face of a basket. Okay, well, my basket that I just put together and put the dots on is drying. I'm going to go ahead and assemble some pretty stemmed flowers and leaves that are going to go inside the baskets. And to do that, I like to work on a piece of bubble wrap, just so that if I have to turn anything upside down, which I often do when I'm putting them together, I don't disrupt the icing decorations on the top of the cookies. These cookies were previously iced, so they're completely dry, so they're less prone to getting messed up anyway. Um, here's one that's completed. I've got two little flowers and a leaf um, stuck to one of these flat coffee stirrers is what they are. 
and I did that with thick royal icing glue, that same body and consistency of icing that I used to put the baskets together. This one's been drying maybe for half an hour to an hour, and now I'm able to pick it up and move it around. So it really is that easy, as long as the icing is the right consistency, to put these, these together. And I'm just going to show you how I do that by sticking one big flower at the end of the stick. If, if you want to see what's happening on the back side, you know, you can turn it over and do that as well. Um, and that sometimes you might want to do that, for instance, if you wanted to create a sandwiched kind of effect. Here I've got a small cookie on a stick. If you want to create a sandwiched effect so that the flowers view nicely from all sides, this is the, t this is the time when you'd want to turn it upside down and that bubble wrap would come in handy. And here I'm going to sandwich this one with another small, small cookie that fits it. And that way you have a piece that actually views from any which direction. Oh, I managed to get some brown icing on that. There, I got it off. And that, you know, the icing's so thick. I, I, I'm moving this around right now without too much difficulty. But when it's one-sided in a heavier cookie, you can't pick it up immediately. You do need to give that more drying time. But typically half an hour to an hour is certainly adequate. I've got a few of those pieces already made. So they're ready to put on these baskets. I'm going to get a, another one out. And I've got a couple leaves here. And maybe that small double decker one is going to work too. And now we're ready. I'm going to ready to actually fill these baskets. And this filling approach is very similar to what I did on my sandwich baskets, which I showed you earlier. So if you've seen that video, this might be a little bit of a repeat, but it's always good to get reinforcement. Now you could approach this by gluing things to the inside of the basket, but I like to fill it up with other things that are edible. Um, one alternative is jelly beans. They're also great to filler material and you can anchor things in them. But today I've got sanding sugar, colored sanding sugar. And I'm just going to pour it in until it more or less goes to the top of the basket. And then these items that I've glued together should stand pretty much on their own. Let's see. This one's already been cut down. These sticks are about four to five inches tall. So I do, this is the typical length they come, but if I want them to fit without any of them, sh any of the sticks showing, I do need to cut them down. I'm going to just put a couple more into this basket because I'm going to also fill it with some Jordan almonds. Depending on the occasion, fill it with different things. You know, if it's Mother's Day, maybe you just put a bunch of flowers in here for mom. But if it's Easter, then Jordan almonds and chocolate eggs. Little chocolate bunnies and things can make great additions to the baskets as well. So I've got a couple flowers in there. That might just be enough because I still need to fit a handle. Let me grab those and talk about those a little bit. These handles are made with rolled fondant. I've got two here because they are fragile just in case I break one. They're made with rolled fondant, which is a sugar dough, which is very malleable and it can be rolled into sheets and cut into ribbons. In this case, I've cut it into a very thin ribbon, about an eighth of an inch. And I've let it air dry at least half an hour, if not longer. Generally, I'll allow overnight, especially if the piece is bigger. Um, long enough that it is rigid and holds shape on its own and does, isn't going to bend or get messed up when I move it like so. And since I've filled this with sugar, it's really easy just to plunge the handle in there and it pretty much stays where I want it. I kind of like how that blue handle looks with, with the blue cookies as opposed to the pink one. So let me put the pink one aside. If you want more detail on how to make those handles, I have a whole video on ribbon work where I work with fondant and modeling chocolate to make different type of ribbon elements, handles, bows, flowers, and a couple of other things. And we'll be coming, we'll be, we'll, you'll have the opportunity to explore that once we finish, finish here. I'm going to stick another leaf in just to fill out that void there and then toss in some Jordan almonds. Again, it's always good to kind of look at this from a distance and see if it's making sense to you visually. I've got some almonds in the back. Sometimes the almonds help to prop things up too, if that's needed. But in this case, the sugar is so deep, I don't really need it. I think just one almond in the front is kind of nice. And my last finishing touch is going to be possibly a bow or a butterfly on the top. One word on the bow, this is actually constructed um, from two teardrop shaped cookies that I iced and allowed to completely dry. And then I glued them together with thick royal icing when they were lying flat. So then now I'm able to pick them up as one element. And that's easier, it's easier to do that step in advance as opposed to trying to glue two halves together on the side of the basket. 
So I am going to, so because now I can handle it in one piece and I don't have another one that I've got to anchor to one that's loose. So I think I'm going to try to set it in this void if it's not too big. I might even be able to stick it kind of partially into the sugar to keep it in place if I put a little more sugar in this corner. So I'm going to try that. Yeah, but I am going to glue it to the side of the basket. So I want to apply my icing here, not too much, and then stick it to another cookie element that it will actually end up drying onto. I think that looks pretty nice, except I kind of hid this flower. So I'm going to move that over a touch. I'm going to take my handy trussing needle, turkey laser, and, and get rid of that brown icing because it'll dry there and show. Clean that up a little bit while it's still wet. And then the last touch will be adding a center to that bow. And I'm going to use, you could pipe a, some icing there if you wanted, but I kind of like these large, I think these are four or five millimeter dragees, which are sugar beads, to form the center of the bow. And I think the blue looks good. We'll keep with the blue theme. Um, again, to stick it on, because it's a relatively heavy object, I'm going to use a dab of this icing glue. Hopefully it'll stick to that bow right there. I'm having a little trouble getting it out. So I'm going to take my trussing needle and try to apply it more directly there. Still having trouble. How about this? Apply it to the back of the bead. So that bead's in place. Um, now if I were to deliver this to a customer or to a friend and had, had to travel with it, I would allow some dry time most certainly so that that bow and that bead stay in place at least an hour. And for driving, I'd probably also recommend removing the handle and inserting it once you got on location because any vibration in the car could cause that to move and just break it. And always have a few extra handles on hand. So there you have it, a contoured basket. In another of my videos, I talk about how to shape that dough, and it's really quite a fun and easy thing to do. So please stay tuned. Live sweetly.